My name is Jim DeVos. I'm the Assistant Director of Wildlife Management at the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I want to welcome you to viewing this video. Uh, it's an important issue to us in Arizona and it will be dealing with many of the options that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is presenting to the public for comment at this point of time relative to the management of the Mexican gray wolf. We're going to start off with a, a couple of things uh, that we need to make very certain that, that folks understand. First of all, the proposals that we're going to be visiting on are proposals from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And what we're asking is that you make comment directly to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The department, although we are a cooperating agency, uh, we have no ability to take and, and record these comments for you. At the end of the presentation, we'll be providing you with a website and a link so that you can make your comments directly and we'll give you some information on how you can do that. First, let's start with a little bit of information on the Mexican wolf. Mexican wolf was eliminated from the American Southwest uh, many years ago, largely at the uh, urging of livestock operators who viewed wolves as uh, serious predators of their cattle. A small group of wolves were located in Mexico. Uh, they were captured, brought into captivity, and they've been the basis for a captive breeding program that was initiated uh, with a tremendous amount of public input and comment uh, in the 1980s. The first wolf release into the Southwest was done in 1998, and there was a number of wolves released into the Blue Range Wilderness Area in southeastern Arizona, southwestern New Mexico. Today what we have before us is a set of rules that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed. The first of them that we're going to talk about is the delisting of the gray wolf and the relisting of the Mexican wolf that will be a result of the overall delisting. The second rule that we'll talk about is the 10J rule, and we'll explain in a minute what 10J is and why it's important to us. And then the third is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is scoping for an environmental impact statement on a uh, new rule that will affect the 10J status for Mexican wolves in Arizona and New Mexico, perhaps other states as we'll talk about. One of the reasons why their interest is delisting the gray wolf at the species level is that we've reached the recovery goals in the northern Rocky Mountains and in the Great Lakes. Uh, there are currently approximately 70,000 gray wolves in Alaska and Canada. The population now in the upper Great Lakes is estimated to be a little over 4,400, 4, excuse me, and the population in the northern Rockies is about 1,675. That brings us to the Mexican wolf. At this point of time, the most recent surveys for the Mexican wolf was about 75 animals. And we know that there are at least that many because those were physically counted, but there are undoubtedly a few that were missed during those counts. As the gray wolf is delisted at the species level, there's concern that the there will be a need for additional protection for the Mexican wolf. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has listed some reasons why uh, they believe listing is warranted for this animal, not the least of which is the small population size. Again, the uh, estimated population was 75, perhaps a few more, but it's below the goal that, that's been listed for years in the recovery plan which is a, a value of not less than 100. Another issue that they are concerned with is that the, uh, one of the primary causes of mortality has been illegal shooting. Uh, there's also other factors, uh, inadvertent road kills, uh, some have been struck by lightning, but the long and short of it is that the number of wolves that have been released in the wild have, have been killed and hence limiting the population recovery. Another issue is anytime you start with a very small population of animals, as we did with the Mexican wolf, there's always a concern for inbreeding. You don't start with much genetic diversity when you only have seven animals to begin with. There's an active management program uh, that assures to the extent possible that the genetic diversity is carried forward and amplified by 
selectively taking and introducing males and females that have great genetic contributions to give. As you have these small populations, uh, there's an issue called genetic drift. And what happens with genetic drift is all animals carry some gene coding that's for uh, characters that, that are not well suited for survival. When you breed close ancestors, it tends to amplify these adverse genes and, and can actually limit the animal's ability to, to survive. When we look at all of these factors in total and look at the area that they're in and, and recognize that they come from such a small population beginning, uh, the overall cumulative effects of these certainly seem to warrant listing as an endangered species. Let's talk a moment about what a 10J is. Uh, 10J is a provision in the Endangered Species Act that allows a great deal of flexibility when we reintroduce and try and recover endangered species, but particularly an endangered species that uh, has inherent uh, different viewpoints like large carnivores. One of the things that the 10J allows is it, is it limits the uh, uh, overall effect of the Endangered Species Act by allowing management. As we go through this, we'll see some of the management that can be done. Uh, if an animal is classified as a 10J experimental non-essential population, it allows us to do management actions. One of the things that's critical in Mexican wolf recovery is societal acceptance. Uh, if there is no societal acceptance, there tends to be pushback on the wolf population and that could enhance uh, both adverse public comment, but it could also uh, affect the amount of animals that are, are illegally killed. The final rule designated the uh, area, the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area in southeastern Arizona, southwestern New Mexico, as a 10J area and as a consequence of that, once a management plan was written in 1998, the first releases were completed. The final rule has provided a framework that's important. It's allowed the establishment of an interagency field team. You can see the uh, agencies that are participating. Uh, we're fortunate that the White Mountain Apaches have joined the effort subsequent to the releases. Uh, we have the Arizona Game and Fish Department as a participant. U.S. Forest Service, uh, APHIS, which is the federal agency, uh, probably better known as Wildlife Services, and then of course the Fish and Wildlife Service is part of the inter interagency field team. The uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed revisions to the 10J rule. Uh, you can see on the slide the Blue Ridge Wolf Reintroduction Area is in the center. White Sands Wolf Recovery Area is in New Mexico on the right-hand side. And the overall shaded portion is the Mexican Wolf uh, Experimental Population Area. The final rule that, the, the, excuse me, the proposed rule that's being uh, addressed now is trying to address some of the factors that they see as, as big issues for the uh, recovery. First, there are concerns that it's been expressed by the public, it's been expressed by some scientists, that the limited, that the area that they have established for releases is too small and needs to be expanded. The second is that there's no wolf dispersal outside the Blue Range wolf recovery area. Uh, wolves that are released inside but wander out need to be captured and returned. Uh, again, a concern is the concern of high wolf mortality and the expanded area would allow some additional management options that would help affect the limited gene diversity that we've talked about. Here's a couple of things that the EIS development of the 10J rule will do. Uh, this is directly out of the Fish and Wildlife Service language. The EIS will analyze proposed revisions to Mexican wolf, Mexican wolf experimental population area. We'll hear that referred to as the MOIPA, the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area, and to aspects of currently authorized regulations 
for management of the non-essential experimental population of Mexican wolves in Arizona and New Mexico. Second is the EIS will also analyze alternatives that include implementing a management plan to authorize take of endangered Mexican wolves in areas of Arizona and New Mexico outside the MOIPA. Simply what that means is that the, it will increase the flexibility that we have in managing the animal and answer some of the uh, issues that the public has raised to us. The first thing that we're going to talk about is the timeline for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service EIS. You can see on the first block that the Fish and Wildlife Service proposed to delist the wolf at the species level, the, the gray wolf level, and then they're going to repropose to list the Mexican wolf under a 10J or an experimental non-essential, but it will be listed as the uh, endangered subspecies. The next block talks about the timeline for public review. You'll see that that timeline has already passed. That ended on September the 19th. The department and another large number of other cooperators have commented on that, and there will be another uh, time for comment as the EIS is finalized and sent for public review and comment. You can see the last part, the goal is to have the final EIS out in July of 2014, so that's a fairly aggressive time schedule for the Fish and Wildlife Service to pursue. The proposed rules, and that's one of the things that we're focusing more on this evening, uh, the first is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service delist and list the 10-J uh, was published in the Fed Federal Register in June 2013. And what that was, that was a notice to the public that these actions are being considered by the service. The next block covers the public review timeline. Comments from the public will be due to the Fish and Wildlife Service no later than October 28th of this year. Public review and peer comment will be incorporated into the draft EIS and a proposed rule finalized in March of 2014, and they hope to issue a final rule and record of decision, which is the administrative portion that says this is now the new rule that we'll be operating under. That's due in August of 2014. The department is currently preparing comments. Uh, we're interacting with a number of our stakeholders and we'll be collecting information and developing our comments to be submitted on time. The 1998 final rule uh, on the non-essential experimental population for the Mexican wolf is currently bounded by Interstate 40 to the north, Interstate 10 to the south, Arizona's eastern excuse me, Arizona's western border and the southeastern and eastern border of New Mexico, including a small sliver of uh, Texas just east of El Paso. There are two recovery areas established within the Mexican wolf experimental population area. The first is the Blue Range. We'll talk extensively about that. The second is the White Sands wolf recovery area. That area was never selected for releases for a few reasons that we'll talk about. The other aspect of the final rule in 1998 was that initial releases had to be confined to the primary recovery zone in the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area. Only translocations, uh, wolves that were removed from the wild after their initial release, uh, either for behavioral issues or the fact that they left the Blue Range wolf recovery area and had to be returned, only those animals could be released into the secondary zone. And a, a key point is that any Mexican wolf that wandered outside of the area uh, had to be captured and returned. So we're going to do a quick comparison to the 1998 final rule. Uh, you can see the map with the areas that I've talked about. The uh, three general areas are being affected by the new rule proposal. Uh, certainly there are some geographic changes. The second is management changes on how uh, agencies and the public can interact with wolves. And the third part is some proposed administrative changes. Uh, when the rule was written and the, and the record of decision issued in 1998, uh, there were some issues that needed minor clarifications uh, so that those that use the rule and, and work with it daily 
have a better understanding and clarity of what's going on. The proposed 10J geographic changes, you can see on the left column, those are the 1998 final rule uh, provisions. As I said a moment ago, it includes small portions of Texas. The 2013, which is the right-hand column or in blue, uh, proposes to remove that area from the uh, MOIPA. The 98 rule included White Sands Wolf Recovery Area as a potential spot for initial releases. The 2013 rule eliminates White Sands. There was some concern about small size habitat quality and limited prey abundance that uh, after reflection on it as a release site, it, it was elected not to be a, a spot that was suitable. The third point is that initial releases were only allowed in the primary recovery zone in the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area. The uh, new rule would allow initial releases throughout the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area and functionally what that did was eliminated, eliminated the primary and secondary zones. So when we see the map again in a minute, anywhere that was within the Blue Range area could have initial releases. The fourth point is wolves dispersing out of the area would have to be captured and returned. The new rule says that wolves can wander outside without having to be captured and not return. So it will allow so, for some natural dispersal if such occurs. There are a couple of alternatives that are being discussed. Uh, right now the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area is limited to the Apache National Forest in Arizona and Gila National Forest in New Mexico. The alternative that's being considered by the service, and certainly this is uh, an area of comment, is to expand the Blue Range area to include more national forest lands, there are three districts on the Tano, uh, the Payson, Pleasant Valley, and Tano districts. It would include all of the Sitgraves National Forest uh, in Arizona, and it would expand to the Magdalena District and the Cibola. Another alternative that's being considered, uh, currently the southern boundary of the 10J area in Arizona and New Mexico is bounded on the south by Interstate 10, uh, one of the alternatives that's being evaluated is to extend that uh, boundary to the international boundary with Mexico. And we'll talk in a moment on another slide about some of the reasons for that. Looking at the geographic changes uh, at, with the area, first, as I said, would be the removal of the Texas area. It's a very small sliver in northern Texas, bounds New Mexico, as you can see. It would remove the White Sands area from consideration for initial releases. It would not, however, take it out of the area where wolves could disperse to naturally. It would take away the secondary and primary areas so that, again, wolves could be released anywhere within the Blue Range wolf recovery area. In 2013, the rule is proposed without any of the uh, Expansion alternatives in consideration would be the blue area. So wolves would be allowed to disperse naturally throughout that area with, without having to be returned. This is going to show the additional areas that are being considered for addition to the uh, area. Here we sh see the Payson, Pleasant Valley, and Tano districts on the Tano National Forest. The next is the Magdalena district in the Cibola National Forest in New Mexico and finally the Sitgraves National Forest in Arizona. So all of those would be additions to the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area and initial releases would be allowed throughout those areas. The area that, that is in blue then would be the area with no other alternative changes where wolves would be allowed to disperse naturally. Some other issues that, that we'll see the ex alternative to extend the uh, Blue Ridge, Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area south to the international border, those are all the areas that are circled. Uh, that would be affected in the 2013 rule 
and the full area in blue would be the uh, area where wolves would be allowed to disperse. One of the interesting reasons for that is in the last four years, uh, the country of Mexico has been actively engaged in, in wolf recovery in their country. Uh, there have been some releases very close to the southern boundary of uh, Arizona, and the potential exists for wolves to move northward uh, if they become established in Mexico. The issue with that is any wolf that would be in Arizona but south of Interstate 10 would have the full protection of the Endangered Species Act, making it very difficult for any of the management agencies to uh, deal with that wolf. It would be fully protected, and the ability to capture it and remove it back to where it came would be very, very difficult under the current status. Some management changes. Right now in the 98 rule, it says that we have to have six breeding pairs would be the threshold for issuing individual take permits on public lands for depredating wolves. Currently, the only time that a uh, landowner could remove a wolf legally if it was attacking his livestock would be on private lands. You can see that the proposal uh, before that permit could be issued would change from six breeding pairs to 100 wolves. Part of the issue for that is, is there is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding on what constitutes a breeding pair. Uh, so we have a difficult understanding of when we reach that threshold. A hundred, much clearer and, and much easier for everyone to understand. There is also no provision, the second point, there's no provision for private land management plans in the Moipa, but there are provisions in tribal lands. One of the things that are being considered is that there are some fairly large blocks of, of land that are in private holdings in parts of Arizona and New Mexico. And under the proposed 10J, there is a potential to develop a management plan with those private individuals and allow initial wolf releases on their private land. The third part, the third point is due care for trapping activities is undefined. Right now, there, there are some instances in both New Mexico and Arizona where legal trapping can occur. The issue with this point is that there is not a clear definition to allow uh, for when an animal would be inadvertently trapped. The new rule proposes some very specific language where if the, the trapper were to follow the language and inadvertently take a wolf, it would not be considered uh, a take, uh, but rather an accidental uh, event and would eliminate any type of criminal sanctions against the individual. Fourth point is individuals can take a Mexican wolf uh, up for self-defense or in the defense of others. There is no change to that rule. There, there certainly is a, a common misunderstanding that says wolves cannot be taken, killed, harassed if they're harming or threatening a, a person. Neither rule says that. Uh, it's very clear that, that a wolf can be taken for provision if they are uh, attacking people. The next issue uh, under the 98 rule, there's no provision for issuing take permits for private or tribal lands. The alternative proposal uh, would be to allow permits on private lands for killing or injuring Mexican wolves on tribal or private lands under specific conditions. And those conditions are well defined in the proposed rule. The next issue that, that where change is proposed, right now depredation is defined as a confirmed killing or wounding of a lawfully present livestock by one or more wolves. On occasion, though, there will be an instance where perhaps a pack of wolves would kill two, young, two calves or, or two livestock animals. Under the current rule, that will be classified as two indiv individual events. Under the proposed rule, as long as those uh, livestock depredations occurred within 24 hours, they would always be considered as one incident. Uh, it's an important consideration because the uh, operating 
procedures now uh, dictate when wolves can be removed for a number of livestock depredations. This changes how that number is calculated and when a wolf may be removed from the landscape for depredation events. The last on this list is there's no provisions for private land taking permits when wolves are attacking pets. There's been a considerable amount of, of public comment about wolves, the concerns that wolves would be killing or, or injuring a pet while they're out recreating. The new rule will allow the, the take of wolves on private or tribal lands when a pet is legitimately being attacked by wolves. And again, it's set for some specific conditions that would be required. Another clarification is the current rule implies that the Endangered Species Act Section 6, which is a section that allows collaboration between state wildlife agencies and the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, doesn't clearly define the relationship between the state when they have a Section 6 agreement and the Fish and Wildlife Service. The 2013 rule clarifies that and establishes firmly what that relationship is. Another point that, that's not clear in the 98 rule, uh, it says only project personnel authorized to take wills in for certain management conditions, circumstances. Uh, this will clarify who that individual can be. Uh, certainly as we expand our list of cooperators, uh, the original thought would be a fairly, fairly narrow group of people would ha have the ability to take wolves, but again, as additional cooperating agencies and, and additional uh, organizations are involved in wolf management, uh, there is a need to clarify who can actually take wolves. The next point is there's no provision for allowable take for federal agencies and authorized personnel. Uh, the new rule clarifies that and, and spells out who those authorized persons are. The next point, uh, the current rule requires that all aspects of the Mexican Wolf program the, be examined on a three to five year basis uh, by uh, knowledgeable people and an evaluation report prepared. The new rule changes that to where there would only be a review solely of the 10J designation and how effective that is. And rather than have three and five year reviews, it would have only a five year review. There's been some discussion. Uh, you can see the 98 rule states that state land within the 10J, but outside uh, the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area are treated uh, as private lands. Are, are sub, excuse me, are subject to private land provisions. The new rule clarifies what a state land component is and clarifies what would and would not be allowed by wolves on state land. I want to remind you that the uh, Arizona Game and Fish Department is not the action agency uh, and you really need to provide your comments to the Fish and Wildlife Service directly. Uh, they are the action agency. They're responsible for the analysis of all the comments they receive in preparing both final rule and the environmental impact statement. For your convenience, we've listed the website, which is the uh, first white website. If you want to obtain a copy of the proposed rules or the uh, announcement for the EIS, you can do that. Uh, through these websites. As I said earlier, for the uh, environmental impact statement, the scoping, uh, the initial comment period has passed. Uh, the service will they'll provide an additional opportunity once the EIS is finalized, so the, the public will have one more round of uh, comments. For your convenience, this is the website and the uh, number that you'll need to look for, the www.regulations.gov is the electronic location where you'll need to re, uh, deposit your comments. And the, in order to do so, you'll have to search for the FWS R2ES 
2013-0056, and that will give you the placeholder within that website so that you can make your comments. Again, for your convenience, uh, we've tried to provide this information this evening. Uh, there are certainly others, uh, other sources of information, but we appreciate your time and taking a look at this uh, video and becoming knowledgeable on the issue. Thank you.